If you were one of the millions of moviegoers who were electrified by the unbearable suspense and sheer terror of Jaws, get ready for Eaten Alive. <coughs> 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 Created by Toby Hooper, maker of the screen sensation, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Marty Rustin presents a new horror classic, Eaten Alive. <laughs> Into this house of terror comes a handful of unsuspecting innocents. Hello? What happens to these people in Eaten Alive will give you the most chilling, terrifying 90 minutes you ever spent in a theater. <laughs> Marty Rustam presents Eaten Alive. What's up, rotters, and welcome back to Boiling Wet, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the best and worst horror films of the 80s and 90s. I'm Stevie, your VHS veteran. I hope you're all doing horrendously. Coming to you on a Tuesday this week, because why not? <laughs> I ain't bound by no rules, but um, I hope you survived and are ready to rot. Last season, I had the privilege of welcoming the boys from Movie Dumpster, Joe and Sean, to discuss Frank Henenlotter's trashed a piece, Brain Damage, Elmer for Life, and it was one of my favorite episodes of the season, and so it was a no-brainer, I've said brain too many times, it's gone weird, um, to open the invite again. Uh, this time, it's just me and Sean, and we sat down to chat about Toby Hooper's 1976 Hicksploitation Killer Croc movie, Eaten Alive. Well, that is one of its titles, at least. Stay tuned to hear a list of its alternate titles. There's a, there's, there's a few. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, the plot feels similar, and you can almost picture it just by hearing that it's about a crazed swamp hotel owner who kills and feeds people to his pet croc in the swamp out back. Uh, this movie came just a year after Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre and sees the return of Marilyn Burns in yet another perilous situation involving a tool-wielding loony. But there are some more experimental touches to this offering, I think. Um, it was filmed on a sound stage with a water tank and this is utilized to create an almost theatrical experience. It feels like we're in Arthur Miller or Tennessee Williams territory with 70s exploitation content uh, with star turns from Robert England, a friend of the pod, <laughs> I can say that now, and Carolyn Jones. It's, it's a somewhat disjointed but often delicious slice of 70s grime. If you're a Hooper fan, it's definitely cemented into the upper echelons of his work. Uh, also, this week on Patreon is a bumper week. Tomorrow, the mates of hell, Alex Ayling and Brad Hansen, join me to discuss Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling. And then Mike Munzer joins me as we complete our Leprechaun retrospective with Leprechaun Origins and Returns. And Matt Draper will be joining me for future frights on the Cellar Dweller tier to discuss Insidious, The Red Door, Bird Box Barcelona, Talk To Me, and more. And I'll be dropping, also on the Cellar Dweller tier, the first episode in my true crime audio essay series about serial killers who were the inspiration for our favourite movie maniacs. The first episode will be on the life and crimes of the awful Ed Gein. But now, let's check into the Starlight Hotel and see if old Judd has any rooms available. Sean, welcome back! Thank you for having me. Okay, flying solo this time. Yes, yes. Joe couldn't make it this time. Because uh, he was he... eaten alive. Yes, well, of course, <laughs> obviously. The uh, crocodile came out of that fucking swamp, Stevie, and uh, that was the end of Joe. Yeah, good meat. Good meat. How are you, dude? And how's, how's the dumpster? Uh, I, I'm good. I'm doing really good. Uh, the dumpster, uh, the dumpster's also doing well. Uh, you know, it's a little swampy in here, especially for this episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're doing good though. We, uh, we just put out our Leviathan episode. I don't know if you ever saw Leviathan. Yes. Yeah. And I, it's really hard to find actually because yes. I had to order like 
um, from eBay, I had to get a Scream Factory Blu-ray, which was triple the price it should have been. But yeah, it was like a collector's item. Yeah, Joe was talking about that in our episode. We had our friend uh, Tony from Hack the Movies, who I believe oh, yeah, was also yeah. on your show at one point. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he said that it was like 130 bucks at least. <laughs> it's ridiculous. American dollars. So I don't even know what you had to pay for that. Yeah, I paid 80 pounds. So yeah, it's about that. It's about the same. Okay, okay. But I wanted uh, it. But yeah, that that check that out. I guess uh, the other stuff going on with the dumpster. You know, we're we're putting out our episodes. Uh, we we also did a stepfather three review uh, last month. We uh, we have an event uh, as of this uh, recording coming up August fifth and sixth. We're doing in Pennsylvania at the uh, Mahoning Drive In. Uh, they're doing uh, an event for the Mario movie, the original Super Mario Brothers movie. Uh, the original, nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, showing on Saturday and Sunday, and we're hosting the movie portion of that, and it's also hosted by uh, our friends RetroWare, who are, are hosting a video game segment there where they're going to be able to play the games on the uh, the big screen at the drive-in. So that's going to be kind of oh, fun. So shit. that's what we got going on right now. That sounds pretty cool. And that's just made me have a flashback to when I was a kid. Did you ever see the Fred Savage film, The Wizard? Yes, yes, oh, when he plays Mario 3. Yes, Mario 3, up on the giant screen at the, yep. the championships with the glove. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm i not big on that movie, but as a kid, what? it's definitely... I liked it more as a kid, but going back to it, it doesn't hold up for me. But uh, yeah, definitely fair, a big one as a kid. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it for a while. Like, in my head, it's perfection. Oh, yeah, you almost don't want to go back, right? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe I won't. <laughs> that's another one that's not easy to find anyway like that and little oh, monsters really? you know all those especially in england there's so many because you guys were just spitting out films back then and we would get them on the vh on vhs and they'd be there for two weeks and then they'd have new stock in and they'd just disappear and go to the bin and i would collect oh, them all so i've got all of the 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 uh, VHSs, but these things still haven't made their way over here on blu-ray and ship oh, that, that's just crazy to me yeah there's so many classics like that. Um, but uh, that's a quite, quite, a, quite a different type of film because uh, sure. today, obviously, we're going to be talking about Eaten Alive. First of all, what is your, what's your history with this one? Ah, uh, you know, I turned it on today for the first time and then I, I am joining you. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh, that makes me really happy. To, to So you're fresh, fresh off the swap. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to speak for Joe, but just because I was talking to him about it beforehand, I think he is a little bit more familiar with the movie because uh, he was telling me uh, that he's a big fan of it. But yeah, this is my first viewing, and I, I'm a fan of this director, so I don't know why I waited so long to watch it. Yeah, he's well, he's got a few, that I, even though his list of films isn't actually that extensive when you look True. at some of the, the big sort of, sort of other horror auteurs. His isn't that extensive, but there's still a bunch I haven't seen. Um, so what what do you think of Toby Hooper in general, then? Is he one of your faves? Um, <laughs> I don't know. See, that's a hard question. I was thinking about that because uh, Poltergeist is one of my favorite horror movies. Mm. And I like Texas Chainsaw Massacre a lot, and two is very good also. So just just for those three reasons alone, he's got to at least be in my top ten, you know, and just think yeah. about the just the odds of that. But I've never really thought about it in, in depth, but that's a good question. What, what about you? I mean, I yes and no, and that's the thing. Normally, with if you look at a Carpenter or a Craven or something sure. like that, you immediately go, oh, I know them. I know their thing. Whereas I think with Toby Hooper, he very much went through stages like this early exploitation stuff has a really grimy and realistic feel and i love that and then he had his coke era when he was doing films like <laughs> life force and invaders oh, yeah. from mars and they're crazy fucking psychedelic out there films but they're not great films I like Life Force a lot, and in yeah. from Mars for a remake is pretty great. But no, you're right; they're not amazing, but they're they're cozy. But I I get what you're saying. Yeah, I feel like his best work was very much his early chunk, and then mm. obviously some of the big big the bigger um, studio ones that he did, like Poltergeist and The Fun House, is one of my favorites. Right, right. And so yeah, it's up and down. I like I don't you know it's not that consistent in in my personal opinion. Um, but eaten alive. Um, so I've seen this twice before. Um, okay. uh, once when I was young because this was actually uh, it made it onto the the video nasties list in the UK and it was one of the first ones that got prosecuted actually and it eventually did get released uh, in I think uh, late seventies like seventy eight seventy nine uh, with loads of cuts and then huh. it got a theatrical release. 
that's a little surprising to me, Ellen, because like I I guess I could understand because of the, due to the subject uh, matter of this film, but it doesn't really actually show anything that bad. Yeah, well, listen, fucking Mary Whitehouse, this bitch over here who started this whole thing, <laughs> the the slightest thing, and I think I think mostly it was the the sort of violence against women because actually yeah. some of it when you watch it in this, it's it, it it was not stunt coordinated. You're like, no. he is throwing her down those stairs, oh, and yeah. that he that she is getting hit. So I think it's more it's probably that more than any sort of a uh, gruesome stuff. All right, maybe, maybe, okay. Yeah, and also it was right at the start of it, so they just started to pick up everything they could. Uh, and uh, but yeah, it was eventually re- re-released, so that that was okay in the actual seventies. So I now have a little Toby Hooper quiz for you. So okay. there's ten questions. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, I, I know. I wanted to see how polite you were going to be with your reaction, and it was very polite. Okay, <laughs> I, I would have ran with it as long as I could have. <laughs> An open Google. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it should have done, right? If you actually kept asking. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to run you through. So, Eaten Alive, um, obviously, in the 70s, this was very much when you get in that exploitation. So, you'd have the sort of fun exploitation, if you want to call it that, with the Burt Reynolds films and stuff like that. And then it mm. got nasty. And this is where we started to get Last House on the Left and this and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I think it really... Because this film reminds me quite a bit of Mother's Day, which was 1980, I think. I was going to say that, yeah. Yeah, and it's got that vibe. And it feels very much in that era. But also in that era is when they had so many alternate titles. And I'm just going to run through a list of what titles this was known as this movie and some of them are from other countries so i've translated them as well so obviously eaten alive Startlight slaughter horror hotel horror hotel massacre legend of the bayou murder on the bayou death trap the crocodile of death the jaws of the crocodile <laughs> the inn of terror the motel by the swamp devil's swamp crocodile mortal trap brutes and savages and Bloodlust, The Night of the Beast. What the fuck? I, I mean, some of those, I think, are actually uh, names of other movies, but well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know that, what, especially in Mexico, it was just released as Crocodile. And then, of course, oh, yeah. Toby Huber went on to direct a movie called Crocodile, which uh, we don't right. talk about. Weird, weirdly enough. You know, it's kind of funny. I don't know if you were going to bring this up, but when I was uh, looking this up on Tubi, there's another movie called Eaten Alive. Uh, right. Explanation Point. <laughs> that, that came out four years later and actually one of the actors is also in that and i was like wait a second oh. what movie am i looking at here it was uh i forget his last name but mel uh for ferrera or something like that oh yeah is in both and i was like well, how the hell does that even happen that's I, that's crazy yeah, yeah mel I, Ferrer, anyway who, who's harvey that's so weird. right yeah yeah it's that's lazy casting that <laughs> i yeah that's an odd one but cast wise this one, I mean, first of all, shout out to Kyle Richards, who plays the little girl, who uh, was um, Lindsay Wallace in Halloween, and who is now yeah. in the other Halloweens. I was like, yes, come on, I'm Real Housewives. Is that what she's also known for? Because I, I didn't really do any heavy... Okay, okay. Because I'm like, so oh she yeah, the, the little main... girl from Halloween, okay. Right, but she is the uh, main woman from uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and she's been on it for like 15 years. Wow. <laughs> What what a career trajectory. Right? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Child star, th- then sort of vacuous televisual star, and then back in Halloween. Right, okay. Full Why circle. Why not? And Marilyn Burns. It's funny, when I watched this film, and I rewatched it today, it feels, and I know this is a weird thing to say, but it feels like it should have been or was before Texas Chainsaw, even though it was after. It feels like this was a run-up to it. Yeah, and that's kind of where I, like, scratch my head a little bit with this movie. I mean, we're going to talk about it, but there's, like, certain elements of this where I could totally see where, like, Hooper's reusing ideas or maybe, like, trying to perfect concepts he didn't nail in Texas Chainsaw, especially, Mm -hmm. like, some of the chase scenes. Right. But, yeah, it's, like, weird seeing her in this. It's, like, I could totally see why he would bring her back. She's a great actress, but I also feel like the way she's using this, I'm just kind of like, eh, all right. (laughs) I kind of wish she did more. I mean, she's impactful, don't get me wrong, but I'm just like, okay, you're going to be, you know, basically relegated to a room for most of the picture. Right, tied to a bed, doing the scream we've seen, that we uh, that we know okay, and yeah. love, but... Well, they cover her mouth with tape, at least. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> Slight <laughs> variation, I suppose. 
<laughs> yes, that's true. What blew my mind when I was looking it up, which I didn't yeah. know, did you see that this was kind of loosely based on a real life killer? Really? No, I did not. Yeah, so it's this guy from the 1930s called Joe Ball. Um, and he was in Texas and he had one of those alligator attractions, which I definitely went to in Florida when I was a kid, where oh you just God. go and see a, a sort of guy in the boondocks who keeps crocs and alligators and you just stand there and watch them rip up animals that, that he's tossing to them they found out that he'd killed a load of girls and the uh the the story goes that he was feeding them chopping them up and then feeding them to his alligators to get rid of them <laughs> I, I i it's some pretty grim shit right so so i could totally see why someone would read that or see that and be like huh let's make a movie around the concept like it, yeah. I, it totally makes sense yeah and also i I think for every 10 of those attractions, at least one is feeding humans to them. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, anytime, days. anytime it's in a movie, I, I forget what it was. It might even have been like Le- Legend of Gator Face or something like that. There's <laughs> even one of those in there. And, the you know, the trainer, if you want to call them that, like gets bit by the damn croc. So it's uh-huh. like, you know, if movies are even making fun of it. You know, people are really dying out there, like you're saying. For sure. Um, so, yeah, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about this film with a hundred titles. First of all, um, this opening section, what did you think of it? So we've got uh, the our, our girl who is uh, newly inducted into the brothel and she gets sent away. Because, well, first of all, we should talk about the setup of this yeah. incredibly icky tone and it is immediately very uncomfortable. Yeah, they don't pull any punches. They kind of throw you right into it, which I, I kind of actually appreciate because then you know mm. immediately what you're getting into for better or worse. Um, even if that part of the film kind of is ends up being window dressing by the end of it, Mm. um, it is integral to the plot as you find out, uh, with this woman who just is, I guess she's there just trying to kind of like, she's a, she's a runaway you find out, but just like trying to do something with her life. And it's like fucking of all people, uh, Freddy Krueger himself walks in (laughs) and is just like being as creepy as humanly possible. And she's like, yeah, maybe. I am not here to be in the, uh, the the sex house. Maybe this isn't for me. Yeah, but also anal on your first day. I mean, it is wow. a lot, isn't it? <laughs> He's buck and he likes to fuck. It, well, exactly, yeah. I know, I think I think Robert England likes to, uh, you know, of course, tell the story that I, I, uh, I came up with that line <laughs> on my own. Uh, it wasn't in the script, <laughs> you know. And then Quentin Tarantino stole it, so, you know. Yes, Now, now exactly. he gets credit, you know. Yeah, 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 totally. I'm um, sure he attributes does... it to it if he's asked. I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, but, yeah, it's a real setup. And then even when she's calling for the madam and then you realise the madam's not even on her side, she's like, yeah, you should have fucking done anal. Get out. Yeah, exactly. Rough. Like, either do it or leave. Yeah. And so she sends her down to the Starlight Hotel. Um, I have Did to you say, see who this madam was, by the way? Oh my god, yes. Um, uh, well, I mean, I <laughs> only know her from no, please from uh, uh, House of Wax, the original. Oh, okay. So, so this is Carolina Jones, but she's fucking uh, Morticia Adams in the original Adams Family. Fuck that as well. No way. I mean, that's what I know her from. I'm, she's one of those actors that's in a hundred things. Oh yeah, she's like golden era. You can, you just, you know her face, and also. What they have they done something to her face? It yeah, looks some, like some kind of makeup job, or makeup or gray sort of. It's like wet tissue. It's really fucking creepy. I I, I didn't read why they did that. If there was a reason for that, other than just like, I couldn't hey, find anything. Uh, make her look creepy, so they like make her <laughs> the right side of her face all messed up, like she had like a really 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 bad stroke or something. Yeah, or it acid is, or something. I I don't know. It's creepy. It's like late Betty Davis that fucking <laughs> a little bit yeah. Out. Um, but yes, yeah, so then we we've, we've got our our setup and our right. our place. This is the Starlight Hotel, and I have to say, even watching it this time, he fucking sets the mood. There's something very surreal, and I really love that you can tell it is a set because there's something yeah. about it that feels slightly dreamlike, and there's. The, the color palette is very bright and stark for the first half of the movie, and then it goes into very muted tones. Uh, what did you think of this? Because it, it just felt it felt weird. It felt really psychedelic almost. 
Yeah, and a lot of these camera angles they're using, especially when they get to this hotel with this fog rolling in constantly, are just kind of all over the place just to kind of really, uh, at least what I think they're trying to do is to set you off guard, especially once you get introduced to this, like, Drebin-ass character with, with a few less marbles, as yeah. we find out. Uh, it's 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 creepy as hell. I will say, though, that I, it, this movie doesn't immediately grab me. It does take a little while to kind mm-hmm. of pull me in, to be honest. Um, like, I, I'm in enjoying the atmosphere like that part of it I'm, I'm digging but once this gets rolling i'm like okay i kind of see what you're doing movie but let's let let's get to the point uh for, uh-huh. for maybe like a half hour and then it starts to kind of grab me yeah i i found that as well i found it definitely dips in the latter half there's a ho- the whole section in the bar when you know at yeah. the point in a movie where things should be ramping up it suddenly drops and we're having you know, Buck, the Robert Englund character, just being a jerk in the bar. And then the, the sheriff is with the sister of the missing girl and they're having a lovely, sharing a beer and having a chat. And it feels very oddly paced at that point. Yeah, I feel like that's just in there to have an excuse for another character to get whacked back at the hotel. But Yeah, for, yeah you're right. And also just to be like, set up Robert Englund a little bit more, hmm. uh, I guess. But yeah, you're right. It kind of takes it out of it. Yeah, but this, this attack on Clara... I it's brutal and it's oh, still yeah. it's still keeping with that that opening scene it's kind of a bit relentless in its tone and you you feel like I'm not sure I'm gonna have any enjoyment in this film and it does ease up obviously a little bit but with the pitchfork and and then of yeah. course throws it just chucks her into the gator it's rough and, and the blood there's not there it's not excessive but uh it's mm. it looks really good in this and that Agreed. gator man it looks bad in a couple shots but I would say probably 90% of the time it looks pretty damn good and especially in this opening kill it's like oh okay this is what we're doing a gator in the friggin swamp here okay yeah right there's you're right there's a brilliant bit we'll talk about it a bit more when it comes but just a very very quick shot when the dog is running towards the open oh, yeah. mouth of the gator and then immediately after that, it's a shot of a toy dog and a crappy gator. And you're like, oh, <laughs> you had it. You had me. It's like the Lord giveth and he taketh. It's yeah, like just... they ran out of budget by then. They needed to just get <laughs> oh. something on film. Yeah, it sucks. So they had a few crocs. So they had this mechanical um, 17 foot long one that was based on okay. a Nile crocodile. Then they had a Diddy three foot one, which was the, the model they use when he's chasing her under the house. Uh, and uh, then... Okay. And then the one that they used in the water, which was a medium size. But um, apparently they, it was mostly rubber and foam. And they left it um, overnight when they were shooting. And they, <laughs> they came back and it had expanded like four oh. times the size. <laughs> so it's this huge bloated gator and they had to dry it out for the no. halt, halt filming. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Love stories like that, though. Uh, yeah, no, sure. I really enjoyed that everything is kind of lit by red light in this first half as well. I guess it's the yeah. sun setting, but it's it works for me. Uh, you you kind of get those uh, Italian vibes from it. Yeah, I hate definitely. to just immediately jump to that, but it's impossible it is, not to think it. Yeah, because the, actually just before when she's kicked out of the brothel and she stood on the steps with the, uh, house, oh, yeah. the housemaid, it's this gorgeous, very Italian shot and it's sort of, like sexual lighting, you know, it's got purples and blues and reds and it looks very suspicious. And it, but that's the peak of it, like five minutes in. Then we never sure. really get those really beautiful shots again, but it, it's there. I mean, you think about it in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like uh-huh. some of those uh, shots. I mean, Toby, of course, is utilizing the sunrise and the dusk and that the desert aspect, aspect of Texas. Now he's in this film now utilizing the more swampy elements of Texas. So mm-hmm. there's a bit of a trade off. But, you know, he tries to use that uh, element here with those red sunsets and everything. And I think it mostly works where he does it. it and it, as I said before, you know, it, it does have this slightly psychedelic feeling. And don't, I mean, don't get me started on the soundtrack and the soundscape because (laughs) it is so chaotic. And it It is, it gets, it works at first and then it's just fucking annoying because you've got sort of music box chimes juxtaposed with just crashes and screeches. And it it was a bit much for me. Well, plus you've got every, you know, animal in the bog, you know, in the background (laughs) too. Monkeys and frogs. Yeah, monkeys. Yeah, this guy's got some weird shit. Like you said, the crocodile uh, farmer, but also like monkeys and stuff he randomly right. has too. Yes, that just dies. Just uh, yeah. causes. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm watching it with my wife. She said, is that monkey dead? I said, I think it just fell asleep. And then the little right. girl's like, this monkey's dead. I was like, oh, I guess it is. <laughs> yeah, this is so random. Uh, so we get this family, right, turn up, yeah. which is Faye, Roy, and then little Angie. So this mm-hmm. is Marilyn Burns. Now, I... Okay, what 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 is Roy's deal? Because I... So something's not quite right with him, right? I don't know. I just know him. It's William Finley from right. uh, uh, Phantom of the Paradise, and he is like crazy in that movie. So I just that's the only thing I can think of is that it's just like this was his style of acting, this over the top with the ex- expressions and everything. Yeah, I mean, he has a full moment when because obviously the dog gets eaten. Oh where God! He goes like body snatches and he's like trembling <laughs> and with his arm out and this grimace on his face screaming at his wife it's fucked up but i love the dog moment yeah he's like oh what am i supposed to do because yeah it's a really messed up moment i mean they kind of like really show what happening he's like up oh, the dog's getting through there up oh, the dog's getting yep, through yep. there up <laughs> oh, it's through <laughs> now the girl's going <laughs> yeah well right exactly and the girl's inconsolable of course uh i, I kind of wish marilyn burns was a little bit more uh upset about the dog but i mean she's got a lot of screaming to do so maybe she was saving her energy yeah now i think there's some secrets though in this family like he is obviously not a hundred percent with us and she rocks up in disguise first of all anyway with this fucking black beehive on Uh, yeah it's very odd i want i want to know that story i want to know what they're on the run from right there's a lot of bee stories we never actually get in this in this film (laughs) definitely there's, they're definitely people of interest, <laughs> for sure. Oh, yeah. Which is so strange, the setup of this family. And then then you've got the the old dude and the sister of the first girl, Rocky. It's so busy for a swamp. Like, it's constant. <laughs> the amount of cars that just come through this place in, what, uh, 24 hours is mental. Uh, there's more traffic here than at Bates <laughs> Motel, for crying out loud. Right? It is. It's constant. And I don't, I, I don't understand. But so then these two are here. Um, yeah. Interesting characters again. I like these characters. It just kind of makes me think of Black Christmas, though, instantly. Not uh-huh. not that another movie can't do the same concept, obviously. Uh-huh. But yeah, I, I kind of feel bad for this guy. And there's like some storytelling throughout when the daughter's talking to the sheriff where you kind of learn like what they've been through about the dad, I guess, has some kind of cancer or ailment. Right. Yeah. And he like spent all this money to hire a private detective. And the timing of that information when you're actually watching the film is kind of uh <laughs> poetic in some sense because at that point the father's already been 86 but it's mm-hmm. it's interesting backstory to these characters that you don't usually get in these kind of films and i'm like huh all right yeah i guess if your daughter was missing you would spend a fortune to find her of course yeah and it's the, yeah and he's racked with guilt isn't he because he's the one that right. sort of turfed her out it's one of those it's just, it's a true sort of heartwarming moment i suppose uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you're laughing, but I'm like, at the same time, I'm thinking about this killer character, and like, th- th- I don't remember the name of this actor, like, he's very effective at what he was tasked to do here, but this is also a killer who's just like, running around, just mumbling to themselves for most of the film, right. and I'm like, I understand what they're trying to do, but I keep catching myself giggling, and I'm like, I that that is not what Toby Hooper was trying to do. Maybe on some level, maybe there was a little bit where they were like, yeah, this is a little funny, right? But a lot of them mm. just like, the guy's supposed to be deranged. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just like, what the fuck did he just say? Yeah, there's a, the bit where he's got Marilyn uh, tied to the bed. He does a whole oh my monologue God. and it is incomprehensible. He's going, uh, and it's about a four minute long monologue and we get nothing. Uh, but he, yeah. he's working some shit out. And I think y- you hear little moments where he talks about uniform or an officer and stuff. So I suppose we're supposed to sit, think it's kind of shell shock or a PTSD from some. He did actually serve the actor Neville Brand. He oh, okay. was in the war. And so I think he brought that to to it i think he and toby had toby said he knew exactly what i wanted and he did it straight away so i think it's he's he's pulling from experience a bit i i wish they maybe leaned into that a little more because the Mm -hmm. only other kind of uh visual storytelling we get with this character is just this like rundown hotel that he runs quote unquote which we've seen yeah and this like he's got like a nazi flag on a chair so i'm like well of course you know that makes sense (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, okay 
And yeah. then, like, muttering to himself, like, on his bedroom at one point. But, like, yeah, I'm just like, okay, I get it. This guy's nuts. Like, and he gets set off easily. Because, like, when the girl first shows up in the beginning before all these other cast of characters arrive, he just happens to be like, oh, did you come from Miss Hattie's? Because she, she was told, right. no, don't mention that. Don't mention yeah. that. And that's what sets him off. And it's just like later in the film when uh, the dad's looking for his daughter – She's like, uh, they talk to Miss Hattie, and, and he, she's like, yeah, that guy, he used to come here all the time, and uh, yeah, we had to kick him out because he was getting too nutty here. And it's like, uh, or something, you know, they explain yes, it better than I am, but you know yes, what I'm saying. He scared the girls, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, though, because I, I feel like there is something there. I, we never, we never yeah. quite get there to work out what's behind it why is he just a nut Mm. because we we do you know as discerning movie viewers we do need a bit more than that and we see you know he does feel bad about the dog because he didn't yeah choose that to happen he's kind of almost crying and then you think is it a moralistic thing he doesn't like the girl because she was uh, you know a sex worker but then he doesn't seem to be that fussy about anyone else well right i mean like the dad you know like you were saying he's kind of freaking out so good right (laughs) This poor kill. bastard. It's, comes... You just got these two fucking crazy men dueling on a porch with a gun, a sickle, and a crocodile. I, I, right, right, yeah, because he grabs this, like, I guess, what is this, a shotgun or some kind of, uh... A rifle, a rifle. Rifle, yeah. And, and yeah, you're right, they're fighting over this this gun and this fucking, uh, scythe, for God's sake. Yeah, scythe. And, and then the guy falls over, and you think, okay, he's about to get it in the neck or something, and this freaking croc jumps up out of nowhere <laughs> and bites him on the head. <laughs> it drags him in. Yeah, it's lo- kind of great. I love that. He's working on his own, the croc, though. That's that's what I like. Yeah, he's got his own agenda. Yeah, 100%. And then with this, I had to look it up, because he then, it cuts to him, and he's got a bag of powder, and I was like, whoa, this is a bit... <laughs> pre cokehead uh, right Hooper. but then he says oh that bc got work straight away so i looked it up and do you know what this is bc powder no i just kind of assumed it was coke of some kind right no so it's basically um aspirin uh huh. and it was a, a big company uh a big you know big farmer and it was just uh, like soluble aspirin um but i did think where did he this fucking <laughs> In the boondocks, where did he source some top quality, immediately working cocaine? Uh, but got no, it, apparently not. Got it out of Roy's pocket before he dropped him in the lake. Yeah, that's what was up with Roy. Yeah. <laughs> also, also, just side note, I love how his wife is like, all right, you're going to take care of that. Great. I'm just going to shower and leave my kid alone in this bed in this yeah. strange building. <laughs> yes. And shower. I'm going to get into the bath in my clothes as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not making good choices, these people, any no. of them. I mean, they're in a horror movie. It's a 70s horror movie on top of that. No one's well, really yeah. making any smart decisions. <laughs> yes. And that's where, yeah, they're all separated. So dad's dead, she's tied to the bed, and now we've got the kid in the crawl space. And that's oh, and he's God. just mumbling. Uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of like the most intense part of the whole movie. Like, anytime we come back to this crawl space, because every time you think they're kind of done with it, they find another way to make it even worse. <laughs> yeah. Because at yeah, first, yeah, right. she goes, uh, she's under there, and he's actually crawling under there trying to find her. And then I'm like, holy shit. This is, like, pretty terrifying. Yeah, that was that's dark. You think he's... And he's really going for her. He's really going for her with the scythe. Like, he's going for yeah. slashes. And I did think, and, and this is the sick part of my brain, I did think, oh! mid-70s they weren't too precious about kids maybe at that time maybe she's gonna get it and then i was i mean i was only mildly disappointed that she didn't yeah well instead i guess he stops chasing her because he he hears like the car pull up or whatever right. and it's the right. sheriff dropping the dad off because he's like you know they go to the sex hotel and then th- this hat <laughs> well because originally he shows the picture of his daughter to to the crazy to judd, guy yeah yeah to judd and he's like oh well, yeah, yeah oh yeah i saw her at miss hattie's and so they go to Miss Hattie's, and she's like, I've never seen her a day in my life. <laughs> yes. So this guy's like, what the fuck? I just want my daughter. So then he goes back, and now uh, he's just kind of like walking around all somberly, and judges, I guess he thinks it's a little girl for some reason, and just like takes the largest swing in his life at this poor bastard. I'm surprised his whole head didn't come off. <laughs> I know. It's like, it's almost a famous moment, though, that... When he pounces on him, it's almost a slow motion shot where he's got yeah. the scythe. It's just a great shot. And I did not remember 
this moment where the scythe literally goes through his fucking neck and out the other side and he can't pull it back out. It's oh gross. my god. Yeah, and like so the good. handle breaks off and it's like this really disturbing scene because uh, the guy's just like dying with this inside him. Yeah. But then like the whole time Judge like trying to just get it off him before the croc gets him because he doesn't want to lose his weapon. <laughs> lose his scythe, yeah. <laughs> he gets it off last second and then, you know, the croc finishes this poor guy off. Yeah, of course. Um, and... That's that's I think that's probably my favorite kill in it. And although I mean we'll come to Robert England's one sure. because then we do get this bit where it really changes pace and we're in the bar. We hit the brakes. Yeah, I think this is the, the the low point of the movie because I think everything else it is what it is. It is slow paced, um, but sure. it has got that that sort of hot sort of swamp air vibe to it, and that's why everything feels a little bit sort of tr- trudgy. But at this point, I. I felt like we were in a different movie. I'm not sure if I vibed with it. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, like, like you just kind of said, it's, it's obviously a low-budget movie, but you can kind of, like, you know, ignore some of those rough edges because everything else is kind of clicking. But then it's like, yeah, this this bar scene is so weird because it's just like, all right, yeah, Robert England is a jerk-off, and, like, is this woman he's with underage? Or she's, mm-hmm. like, because they make a comment about, oh, wow, is that a, is that a soda pop she's yeah. drinking? Right. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, because I don't really actually know how old Robert England is in 19 set was it 1979. Yeah, well, he's 75 now. Oh, 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 maths. I, I he might be in the ballpark there, but I think the implication is that she's too young. Yeah. Um, and then like you know they're hustling people at the pool table and like getting into like they have a friend that's almost like flat top top esque who's like mm-hmm. getting into it with this guy at the bar like ah oh, you see something you like. <laughs> And I'm like, all right, Toby, this is like you just trying to redo the Sawyer family a little too much here. Yeah, it is that, isn't it? And I guess, like, uh, what's uh, Kim... Um... Kim Henkel? Yes, uh, Henkel. came back. So I don't know if that's just something that they came up with or if Toby came up with. You know, it doesn't really hurt the film that much, but in the back of my head, I can't help but think. And it's like, all right, yeah, just like the Sawyers. Okay, yep. Mm. This guy, you... again, like I said, this guy's kind of like Drebin if he had a few more screws loose. Yeah, he's got it together a little bit more. I think what makes that whole section even stranger is because then we immediately go into a cacophony section where it's lots of different shots of people doing things so you've got uh the girl under the house you've got marilyn tied to the bed you've got judd searching the house and you've got buck in the bedroom and it kind of works (laughs) but it also kind of really fucks with your head lots of quick shots and it, it was a lot well, because I guess what's the idea there is like, you know, Judd... It's a build, isn't it? It's a build. Yeah. We don't know what's coming. It's going, that back, that banging, that bed is banging for a bad reason. That one's banging for a good reason. He's got this. He's got <laughs> that. It's like... <laughs> the little girl is not yelling enough. Like, she's yelling just enough to be like, huh, what was that? But not enough to be like, wow, uh-huh. we should be concerned. <laughs> but like, I guess, I guess like uh, Robert England can't get like... He can't stay hard enough because he's too distracted by all the other noises. So he finally just yeah. gets up and he's like, I'll be right back. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to go to my doom. And uh, <laughs> he's walking around in his blue jeans and he goes outside. And this is where Judd kind of comes up to him. And he's like, yeah, what are you doing? Because he hears like the little girl out there screaming. Right. And he's like, ah, oh, oh, be quiet. I can hear something. He's like, yeah, I know about that already. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, he's going to push his ass in, right? Yeah, right. And he does. And he does. The thing is with the sounds at this point is... <laughs> oh, the cacophony of them. The were co- yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not It's not mixed in a way of, okay, so we're going to have... Okay, what, what I want to build up an ambiance is we're going to have some frogs in the background and we're going to have those <laughs> quietly. And then, then we're going to have the radio playing some country music. So we'll have that oh, muffled yeah. behind a door. Then we'll have the sounds of uh, Robert England and the girl, you know, going, oh, ha, 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 while he's, we close up on her nipple and stuff. And then we'll have... Over the top of all that, Marilyn Burns screaming and kicking through the wall. But what they've done is they've set each thing at exactly the same level. So you've got fucking frogs and country music and screaming and banging. It's just like... <laughs> it's too much. Yeah, they, they set the audio level all at the same. Yeah, I see what you're ten. saying. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes. it's like ten, fucking... Blo- ten, 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 ten. You do... You do you do not want to watch this movie with headphones on. Fuck. No. I don't think you'll come out alive. Oh. <laughs> you need a hard drink. Yeah, so yeah, he gets thrown to the croc. And now, this is, for a 1976 shitty sort of low-budget horror movie, 
for an animal attack, it actually works for me. And I think it's yeah. mostly because it is sold so competently by England. Oh, yeah. He he sells the whole thing. This thing fucks him up royally. Yes. The, the, the dragging. And he's got that, you know, he's holding on. And he's dragging him back. And the pool of blood. It's good blood. It's like, yeah. it's not cheap, shitty blood. It looks like blood in the water. Yeah, like I said, there's not a ton of blood here, but any time that they do use blood, especially when people are getting eaten by this thing, it's like, yep, it looks good. And I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a really great moment. It, as I said, it's because he's selling it so well. You don't really analyze the croc and go, how, how good is that? You don't care. It's just a one whole picture that you see rather than elements. Exactly. And then like his girlfriend or whatever the hell she is to him, like runs out. And I was kind of shocked at this. She actually gets away. Right. I was waiting for a, a Texas Chainsaw moment where the, the guy in the <laughs> the guy in the car oh, yeah. is like one of the family or something, you know? Right, or he gets taken out or something. But th- yeah. this is definitely one of your Texas Chainsaw kind of moments for sure with this guy chasing her in the uh, the, the woods with Through, this yeah. the scythe. And I'm like, ah, I almost wish this was a chainsaw because they I, – I feel like this was intentional, but they kind of like ham it up a couple times when he's trying to attack people because of how big this fucking thing is. He keeps getting yes. caught up on like the walls and like <laughs> right. on the uh, like gates and stuff. And he's like getting stuck on branches like while he's trying to get this woman. And I'm like, all right, that's th- there's a little quirkiness to that at least. Yeah, because it's like the actual blade is nine foot from the ground because he's the way he's raising it. So it is yeah. it is a little bit comical. And of course, yeah, you get you get the, the female spilling into the open and getting away to safety. And that that is literally the end of Chainsaw, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. In the back of the truck, right? Yeah, right. Uh, maybe it's a little personal homage, but, but it just feels weird that mm. she gets away and we barely knew her. Yeah, but hey, why not? But then... There's- that makes me wonder, then why did we have the bar scene? Ah, that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up time, because he's when they come back to him, that's when he's like mopping everything up. <laughs> right. Um, I loved the moment, I think it's really tense, when he's like, fuck, right, I can't get to this fucking girl under my house. The kid has been under my house for seven hours, and I can't get to her. Do you know <laughs> right. what? I'm just going to fucking let the croc go get her, and he just pulls back the grate. Yeah, and the whole time the damn thing's trying to get him, and like earlier in yes, the movie, yes. the sheriff or somebody mentions like, oh yeah, Judd, yeah, you know that croc? He got it from the actual Nile in Africa. Yeah, it bit <laughs> his leg off, by the way. Yeah. And he has like a wooden leg, they show. Yeah, that confused me, because... That moment, I thought, oh, is that why before, when he gets shot in the foot, he says to Marilyn Burns, oh, it didn't hurt much. Right, But then I thought, no, why would he bother protect... And why would he bother pretending to her that it was a real foot? I, I don't know. Yeah, he's got a, that weird wooden leg as he pulls his sock down at one point. They'd make a point right. to show it. And there, there's a gag at the end of the movie even with there it. There is, yes. There is. Which, if you didn't clock that, you might just think it's a really shitty effect of a yeah, leg. Yeah, you'd be like, what is that? If you, if you <laughs> missed the earlier mention. <laughs> Did she, she does get away there, the little girl, right? Because then we've got the sister who is, is there and she finds Marilyn. And that Judd's just chasing and mumbling all over the house. Well, while that's all going on, she's like, you know, untying the mom, uh, Marilyn Burns. Uh-huh. That's it. And the little girl's getting chased by the fucking croc. And it's it's kind of an intense scene. Now, there's a couple shots where it doesn't look that good. But I think for the most part, they use their camera angles, angles wisely to kind of make it look like this thing's right on her ass the entire mm-hmm. time. And yeah, mm. then she gets out at the last possible second. She's like climbing up the fence, right? And uh, they uh, they run out, and they're like, "Oh my god!" Uh, and th- at this point, this is when they thought with the the soundscape, they're like, "Do you know what? I think it's missing something." So you've got the frogs, the <laughs> fucking crocodile, the screaming girl, the screaming women, Judd, the radio. And then they're like, what? There's something. There's an element that's missing. I know. Xylophone music box lullabies. <laughs> Literally, it's like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star gets mixed into it. The only thing that was uh, missing was making like the croc roar when it like bit the guy but, at the end. Well, here. I was waiting for that. I mean, how many times have we seen crocs roar in these movies? <laughs> exactly. Well, we've heard Jaws roar, so why not? <laughs> yeah, that's the best one in yeah, number yeah. four, if for sure. Uh, but- <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But, like, you kind of know if you've seen enough of these kind of movies. Like, the moment they showed this damn thing, mo- moment 10, you knew it by moment 
uh, hour 29 or whatever the hell this is, mm. that this guy was going to get eaten by this friggin' croc, and that's exactly what happens. Marilyn Burns pushes him over the edge, uh-huh. and he gets fucking chomped in the face. And then we do, as you say, get the little comedy stinger, where his little wooden leg flows to the surface. <laughs> through this thing devours them alive eaten alive there you go right um i don't fully know how to express how i feel about it because i feel like the movie is a great representation of how i feel about toby hooper as a whole like Mm. it's there's great setup and great elements then there's some random moments that dip and then there's some seriously enjoyable but fucking mental coked up moments (laughs) And so I, I, I think it's a really good representation of him, but it is, it's become obviously a cult classic due to it being so closely related to Texas Chainsaw. And I think it does deserve it because I think it works nearly all the way through. And <laughs> the amount of shitty movies I watch, I don't get to say that that often for this <laughs> for this podcast. Uh, that's totally fair. I... I... I gotta say, I didn't really like this movie. There are no. definitely parts of this, I will agree, that are fucking amazing. Like, when, when the, anytime the crocodile shows up, that's where it sucks yeah. me in. I want more stuff with the crocodile. Uh, the scythe, I, I don't know. Like, it, it's kind of interesting, but, like, this bad guy just is just kind of, like, overly comical. So I kind of almost, like, I don't know if it's supposed to be a dark comedy or if it's supposed to be played straight. It's just, like, it's giving me too many myth, mixed signals. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't say I hate this by any stretch of the imagination. Like, I would definitely put this on again. Uh, it, it's pretty fun. Now, I, I definitely would watch Poltergeist or Texas Chainsaw Massacre before this if I'm going to throw one of his films on or <laughs> well, even Life yeah. Force. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was, this was fun, even though I didn't really like it, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I, totally I can enjoy it. I enjoy it for what it is. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I said this earlier, but like they really used their budget well. I'm assuming mm-hmm. they didn't have a ton of money and, uh, they made that crocodile seem realistic. Uh, and they made this guy scary for the most part. Again, the muttering to himself, that's where they kind of lose me a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that some of the parts in between, like we said, the bar and some of these scenes were like some of the tension scenes, I think, do work really well where they're kind of just dragging things out to kind of build up tension. But other ones, I'm like, all right, let's just move on to the next part, please. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah. it's not totally successful, in my opinion, but it's definitely worth watching. Yeah, I agree with you. Definitely the the crocodile moments are the most exciting. And I don't know if it's a good thing that there are so few because it makes you appreciate them more or not. It feels like he's making a exploitation film along the lines of the the amount of sort of swamp families that we've seen around this time. And the crocodile is a bonus. Like, just give, give us that every now and then. But I think I would have loved it to focus more on being a a, a killer killer creature a killer because we've seen that fucking thing it's not being controlled at all when it fucking breaks through the 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 sort of banisters and stuff you know it's if it can reach someone it's having it and so i like the idea that actually if it focused more on that that once it's out it's like under the house and no one can get away and stuff like that i would have liked a bit more of that but as yeah i mean it's fine you know you get to see a pre freddy robert england doing his character acting as he as he enjoyed so much. <laughs> yeah. And uh he he's good in this. He is. He's so good. He sells it. Yeah, nice. Thank you, buddy. Uh I really enjoyed that. It was uh, so much fun talking to you about it. And um Yeah. Yeah, what was it last time we did? Brain damage. Brain damage. Yes, yes. That was also a uh, blast if you will. It a really brain was. blast. Brain blast? Yeah, that's the thing now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll see myself out, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, but yeah, also send Joe, my love. Yes. And, um, I'll get you guys back on soon. Is there anything else coming up that you want to plug or anything? Um, can snap for? Like I said, I if you, you want to yeah. check out Movie Dumpster, we're, we're pretty much everywhere you get your podcast. We're on YouTube. You can check out me and my uh, co-host, Joe Lascola. Uh, we talk about some of the kind of stuff that Stevie talks about. So we're kind of in similar uh, realms. Yeah, the wheelhouse. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I kind of pitched what we've put out recently earlier in the show, so mm-hmm. you know where to go. And uh, I guess if you want to check out, we have a new website. Uh, we have mm. a new website, so it's at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Uh, we're putting Sweet. out some new merch soon, so that's about all I really got to say. Oh, check nice. us out. Well, let's do a swap. Let's swap t-shirts. Sure. I'll send you one of mine, you send me one of yours. Oh, hell yeah. Let's do it. Sweet. Thank you so much, man. Take it easy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.